feature five presents, the audiobook of Hail the Rise of the Griffins by J.K. Noble. Chapter 1 The only way to tell time inside the cellar is by studying the sunlight, which pours through a large crevice in the brick wall. Two ragged bodies sprawled across the cement floor watch as the light fades. They share a troubled look, knowing what horrors the evening will bring. One of the bodies is Hale, a young man, nearly sixteen years of age. He extends a heavy arm to his older sister, Carly, and the shackles that bind him rattle. His cuff digs further into his skin, and he bites his lip. Carly reaches out for him as well, wrapping her arm around his shoulders. He can feel her shivering. Carly must sense his worry. Hale, I'm fine. Just a little cold. Carly's once plump, very colored lips are now a sickly shade of purple, and her cheeks have lost their fullness and color. Under her eyes are heavy, dark circles. It's hard for Hale to look at his older sister this way, recalling the beauty she once possessed. Grabbing the blanket that they share, Hale throws it over himself and his sister. He pulls himself closer until his head rests on her bony chest. As he moves, his left arm dangles above his head. The three-foot chain connecting him to the stone wall is not long enough. His iron shackles press deeper into his open skin, but Hale tolerates the pain as warmth finally radiates between them. To their left, the door above the stairs opens with a light screech, and candlelight from the floor above pours through, illuminating the dark cellar. The cellar is bare except for two large buckets, one in the far corner for defecating, and the other beside Carly, filled with water for drinking and bathing. The shelf to Carly's left holds two bathing rags, two glasses for drinking, and a few candles, which were lit and replaced at sunset. A man walks through the door and locks it behind him, descending with slow, lumpish steps. Hale knows this man only as his abductor. Carly, on the other hand, would have dared to call him family in another life. His summer eyes, the color of deep waters, droop with lack of sleep. His lips quiver as he lights the candles on the shelf. Carly takes a deep breath and removes her arm from around Hale's body. The abductor halts before her, and they lock eyes for a long moment. Watching the two staring at one another is off-putting for Hale, but he is clueless about the fact the two are engaged in a telepathic conversation. Carly senses the lack of the man's mental barrier. He has not taken the potion he regularly uses to keep her telepathic gifts at bay. She understands this as an invitation to enter his mind, that he has something to say to her, and only her. We've wasted enough time, Carly. Bayo needs him to come back home, says the man. If you were in my place, would you give him to Bayo? She counters. His life is not your concern. Bayo is his rightful guardian, he declares. I will not destroy his life for that reason. At least tell him. Give him a choice, he pleads. The less he knows of our true identities, Grion, the better. He still has a chance to live a good life. Your stubbornness will only bring you strife. Grion sighs and kneels down to unshackle Carly from the wall. Hale's stomach turns as the man touches his sister's wrist and he lashes out, kicking him in the leg. Don't touch her. Grion ignores Hale's blow and gazes at the fearful young man. Those eyes puzzle Hale ever more, for Hale could never understand how a person with such kind eyes could act so maliciously. But Hale watches in horror as Carly is pulled from the ground with a tight grip on her forearm. Her legs falter beneath her, the cement scraping her knees. As Hale's rage intensifies, he recalls Carly's words just a few hours prior. When he comes for me today, do nothing. Stop fighting, Hale. Dumbfounded, Hale had retorted, do nothing. He wants to kill you. She had shaken her head. No, he doesn't. He would have done it already. Hale, listen to me. Don't push him to hurt you. Close your eyes and do nothing until it's over. If we don't fight, 
we will never escape. Fighting won't do us any good. We are too weak to fight. We need to be smarter than that. Ignoring his sister's words, Hale had continued to try to slip through his cuff like he was able to do a few evenings ago. However valiantly Hale fought, he fought against his kidnapper those nights prior, his efforts were futile, and as punishment, his arm was burned with a hot piece of metal. Now Hale watches his sister kneel before this man as she is struck down with a heavy hand across her face. Her hair goes flying in front of her. Hale shakes and pulls at his shackles, fresh blood trickling from his wrists. is no use. They're tighter than they used to be. Tears overwhelm his eyes with every passing bang and moan. He tries with all his might to heed Carly's words and not look. For a long moment, there is no noise and Hale opens his eyes, assuming it is over for the day. Instead, he sees his sister on the ground, the man crouching over her with his hands at her throat. Carly kicks her legs and tries to pry his fingers from her neck. The sound of her gusts fills the cellar, and suddenly her arms fall to her sides. Hale screams. Bjorn releases his hold on her neck. The marks of his hands are on her throat. Tears pour from his eyes, but he's quick to wipe them, so Hale will not see. He stands up as Hale screams, turning his back to the boy completely. He can't face him now after what he's done. Hale's sobs echo throughout the cellar, and he scrambles to his knees, trying to reach out to his sister. Carly, wake up, wake up. His heart pounds from his chest as he shouts her name. He pulls on his chains, but she's too far. Through his flowing tears, he cannot tell if she is breathing. He wails at the man. What do you want from us? Brion simply stands, his expression melancholy. Hale looks up at him, waiting for something, anything. But Brion gives no answer. What do you want from us? Hale asks again. Brion doesn't respond. Why won't you kill us? Hale whimpers. End it already. Brion lifts Carly into his arms and carries her back to her place to the left of Hale. He gently lays her down and begins to shackle her wrists. Hale quickly takes her unshackled wrists in his sooty hands and checks for her pulse. She's alive, Brion says. It is the first time he has ever spoken to Hale. Hale is shocked. Brion's voice is soft and quiet. I need something from her, and therefore I cannot kill either of you. What do you need? Hale asks. I'll give you whatever you need. Just please let us go. The man kneels down to unlock Hale's cuffs, and Hale's heart leaps with hope. As Brion pulls at the metal, Hale's skin tears from the places it's bonded it. Hale whimpers, and Brion continues on with a gentler hand. Then Brion gravely responds, You cannot give me what I need. He pulls Hale up and pushes him toward the large tin bucket to the right. Hale screams, no, no, stop, please. He tries to fight his way free, but Brion overpowers him. Hale is forced to his knees, and his head is pushed into the bucket. Hale fights the grip at his crown, straining his neck. He begs in panic, we'll give you anything you want. Please, you're not an evil man. Brion hesitates before he flatly says, you know not what you say. He pushes Hale's head down. Hale's arm thrashes, and he hits the brim of the bucket in panic. But Brion pins Hale's hands behind his back. For a brief moment, Hale's head rises from the water. He inhales deeply and gasps, please, stop. But Brion pushes him under once more. Hale's gurgling rings in his ears. Do you see what you have forced upon me? Grion shouts. I've waited patiently for you. I shall wait no longer. Stop. Carly manages with a hoarse voice. You cannot kill him. No, that I cannot do. But how long are you both to suffer from this pain? Shall I keep you for an eternity? Hale feels his head becoming light. Unable to hold his breath anymore, he exhales. Hale frantically scrabbles at the bucket, and in his fit, he manages to wiggle his left arm free, snagging the pocket of his assailant. Out from this pocket, something falls with a slight clank. Grion tries to regain control of Hale's arm, and Hale's vision dims to black. The water stills, and Hale's body is limp, 
Gron pulls Hale from the water and rests him on his back. He turns Hale's head to the side and presses on his chest until water spews from his mouth. Calmly, Gron places Hale back beside Carly and shackles his wrists once more. He turns to her. Give me what I need. I will no longer hold back. You both cannot take much more of this. If not for your life, do it for his. She pulls Hale into her arms and checks his burning forehead. Then you will have condemned us either way. He sighs while climbing the stairs. You are giving me no choice. She looks at him with disgust, her voice weak and frail. You've told yourself that for hundreds of years. Do you truly believe you are not a monster? There is a click as the door locks, then all is silent.